Welcome everybody to today's webinar on leveraging VR in the chemistry classroom. We're extremely excited with all of our amazing panelists that have gathered here today. Um, so before we get started, I just wanted to give some quick opening remarks um, and a quick overview of modern virtual reality. Um, so it's super important to know uh, what modern virtual reality is not. Um, and so they're not 3D TV glasses um, that you might have seen at movie theaters or even your TV. Um, they're also not the type of VR headsets that you see uh, that enable you to use your smartphones um, and what we like to call 3DOF or three degrees of freedom VR where you can look around only and have a 360 experience. Um, modern virtual reality, uh, the way we define it is it's actually a lot more than that. Um, and lastly, it's also not tablet or phone based augmented reality or AR where you can use your phone um, and have some holographic image in the real world. Um, and so some of the trends that we've been seeing in modern virtual reality is that, you know, especially with COVID in the past year, we've seen an extremely increase in uh, remote and distance learning. Um, with the headsets such as the Quest 2, we've seen better, faster, and cheaper modern virtual reality headsets. And I put cheaper with an asterisk there because uh, there are some implications about that, which we can definitely talk about later. Um, and then lastly is that, you know, with uh, virtual reality, there's a tremendous amount of a maturing ecosystem when it comes to all the different types of solutions uh, that are becoming available. Um, so what does actually modern virtual reality, how is it different from uh, the other things that it's not uh, that I just mentioned? Well, first off, it has head tracking and stereoscopic 3D. So it's not just the 3D element, it's that you know, as you move around the environment, it also tracks uh, your movement. And then perhaps the most important thing and what I like the most is the fact that you get your hands in the environment such that you can make high fidelity adjustments in the environment in and of itself. Um, and overall, what this amounts to is this, uh, what we like to call presence or you, the fact that you feel like you're actually in that virtual environment or that actual virtual uh, object is there. So a uh, quick little agenda, that was just the opening remarks here. Uh, you know, I don't wanna to talk too much. I wanna definitely uh, give the floor to our amazing panelists today. So uh, we're gonna meet the panelists. We're gonna do some basic introductions. Um, we're gonna have some discussions and those topics are going to include uh, incorporating VR into lesson plans, maintaining a VR classroom and the challenges and benefits of VR as an educational tool. Um, and lastly, we're gonna have a Q&A period at the very end. So please, if you have any questions, feel free to post on the Q&A box uh, within the Zoom interface, because then we could take a look at those and uh, be sure to answer your questions. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to let um, uh, our panelists introduce themselves. So Tina, if you could uh, start off with some basic introductions and how you got involved with, with virtual reality and uh, and uh, I think we could start from there. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Tina Kin. I'm the chemistry librarian at Harvard University. So we start our VR uh, project since 2019. Uh, we uh, have a grant and a purchase like a 30 uh, Quest headsets uh, equipped with the uh, nano software uh, and applicable in uh, a chemistry undergraduate classes. Uh, so we create, uh, we, we use 30 headsets, create a wireless piece list and pours, uh, portable virtual reality chemistry lab. Uh, that's what we're using uh, in every semester. So yeah, thank you. Fantastic. Simon? Hi, uh, my name is uh, Simon Lee. I'm an assistant professor at Louisiana State University. Uh, well, the way that I got into VR was uh, I was at the Beckman Institute as a postdoc in Illinois and they had an outreach event to uh, young kids coming in and they had a virtual reality headset uh, demonstration and it, the line was super long. I had to get in line to experience that as well. As soon as I got inside, I was like, my mind, I was mind blown, like totally mind blown. Uh, like you can walk into proteins and look inside, crawl inside, do whatever you want. Uh, so I, I decided this will be a really nice opportunity for edu uh, chemistry education. So I, uh, as soon as I got here, as an assistant professor, I wanted to implement uh, VR into chemistry education. Uh, so I used uh, my, some of my starter funds to get a couple of devices and have been experimenting with the students uh, in small numbers uh, and 
figure out how to effectively use uh, VR for education and chemistry for now. Yeah. Thank you. Gareth? Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Gareth Denyer. I'm a uh, professor of biochemical education at the University of Sydney in Australia. Uh, I've been teaching for about 35 years. And, my, and I can honestly say that the most jaw-dropping experience I've ever had in taking a class is when we had a class in, in using Nanome to look at protein structures in virtual reality. And at, there was a moment where we, we said to the class, you know, all, all go to this, this uh, histidine residue and, and touch it. And suddenly, uh, 26 pairs of hands landed, on, landed in this space and, and everybody screamed. It was the most incredible experience. Uh, we get in, in, in the most incredible engagement when we, we use the virtual reality discussion. It's a great leveler. It's the most fantastic thing you can do. Awesome. Anna? Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much um, for having me along today. But um, I'm uh, assistant professor at uh, Faculty of Health, Health Sciences and Medicine at Bond University in Queensland. Australia, not Perth. And uh, yes, look, I've been teaching biochemistry for about um, 13, 14 years uh, or so. And in particular, um, we've brought uh, 3D technologies into the program for the last um, four or five years, um, mainly with um, virtual molecular modeling type types uh, assignments and things, but also 3D printed proteins and um, some colleagues were working with VR with, uh, in anatomy in the faculty and, and I thought, oh, it'd be great to see if we can bring it into, um, into biochemistry. So that's where we started last year uh, using nano um, for protein structure. And, you know, Gareth, I, I totally agree with your comments there. It's, it is so amazing for students to have that idea that they're actually in and can, um, you know, walk inside the protein. I think it's such a realization for students, um, brings it to life so much more. And that's, that's the whole idea uh, really is just to engage them and just, you know, try to get them to make a mental picture, which has always been a, a difficulty, you know, for um, molecular level um, events. So anyway, thanks for having me along. And uh, yeah, I'm so excited to hear everyone's uh, experiences. Definitely. So um, the kind of the first uh, topic is um, uh, kind of getting to know the process of modifying your lessons plan to incorporate VR in the classroom. Um, and so Gareth, you just gave a, a really awesome example of, you know, the, with the hands, like wh what did it take? What was the process like um, to get, uh, you know, that event to actually happen? How did you modify the lesson plan to enable that? Um, well, it wasn't really so much uh, modifying a, a lesson plan. It was really just uh, recognizing the opportunity. And I think all the other panelists have, have sort of said that. It's not that uh, it was just the fact that something new has come along and you suddenly see the opportunities that present themselves. So as Sevin said, just this experience of him being in the molecule and, and that's, you know, as, as Anna sort of backed up. But it, it was also the fact that the, the, when you're in virtual reality, everything is very scalable. So at one moment, the molecule can sit like a golf ball in your hand. And the next moment, you can be in the, the, the binding cleft of, of, uh, of a receptor. And so the, that ability to move seamlessly from you know, the molecule being tiny to you being tiny uh, is, is one of the... This, it, it, incredible aspects of the, the whole experience. So it's not so much that we modified lesson plans, it was more that we extended uh, the repertoire that we had available. Is that what was the experience with, with all of you? Did, did everybody feel like they were just expanding what was, you know, and saw the opportunity? Or did anybody kind of specifically go into a lesson plan and be like, oh, wow, this is exactly where VR could fit in? Or I'm, I'm curious to hear if that was a kind of a universal thing among all of our panelists. Uh, well, like for me, I, I uh, agree we were already sort of in that space and we'd been designing some 3D technology assignments and we just, you know, saw that, well, this is a, just another fantastic 
platform, but actually much better. And we're actually doing some educational research around comparing uh, those technologies um, and with some colleagues from Griffith University here in Queensland um, who in, in school pharmacy. Um, and, you know, you know, we're finding that it's just um, a, such a fantastic tool to bring to life the things that we're already, already trying to get across. Um, and I think for me, anyway, that's been my experience. Um, yeah, I agree with Anna. Uh, I I come here when I see the uh, special chem uh, see the stereo chemistry and a, a complex protein structure. I feel that'll be great. People can see that in a three D environment. And also uh, at Harvard, uh, we have another class uh, in a French class. People can actually go using a VR, go to the French town and talk to people in French. <laughs> in French, so it's a very I, I love those interactive experience, and then I love the you immerse yourself in your environment uh, to learn. Uh, I, I yeah, I just dreamed uh, one day I could uh, finally can uh, teach Chinese, uh, teach uh, chemistry with such uh, uh, amazing uh, technology. Yeah, I agree with you all. Like uh, every student, uh, when they go into VR, there is kind of a, a wow moment that they didn't realize they can do that. Like as Gary said, small molecules and expanded like bigger than your house, and they go, "Whoa, what's going on?" Uh, so that there's that moment. And for the a class, uh, initially I just tried to do it in a normal class, like a normal classroom setting, like uh, make expand the PDF size so that it's it's like you're in a in a large auditorium. Uh, and then you have the molecule in front of you. Now, but it's in the classroom, you just grab the small molecular models in front of your hand. It's uh, people far away can't see it. But in this case, they can come behind my back and they can teleport around and they could look around uh, from every single angle they want to uh, on about this molecule. So that's a totally different experience compared to normal physical classrooms. So it helps a lot. And, and so in terms of going about this process of, you know, from a practical perspective, um, incorporating virtual reality, um, you know, what kind of considerations did you have from, you know, budgetary to technical to, um, you know, uh, making sure your IT infrastructure is all set up? Um, I'm curious to hear what, you know, what does it actually take, if you will, you know, the, the actual time when you get the students in uh, is awesome. That's, that's great. But, you know, as an educator, what are the sorts of the challenges that you had to overcome in order to enable that? I would pick. Let's say. Let's see, let's see uh, what Anna has to say about this. Thank you. Um, well, you know, it's some sometimes some challenges uh, for for this because uh, this particular semester for me, um, compared to say uh, this same subject teaching last year in the middle, we were hundred percent remote. But this time we're kind of multimodal um, which means that I you know have a bunch of students in front of me but I've also um, got some students remote and trying to give these students all the same experiences is a challenge doesn't matter what you're doing but um, with a VR in order to do that obviously the remote students can't come and put the headsets on um, but we've, we've been trying to um, cast the session uh, and that's been quite technically challenging, um, not the least of which is because the, um, the uh, Wi-Fi, uh, the, the university Wi-Fi has to be circumvented and we can't get through. Um, so we have to, you know, go uh, around using our own uh, independent sort of Wi-Fi. And, and I mean, that's all doable, but like just getting it to cast um, for those students has been a bit challenging, but we've done it. It's, it's all, it's doable, but it, it can be a bit complex. Um, but yeah, the other challenges around um, purchasing the, the quest, I've got um, just some small bit of funding uh, for the educational side of things um, for a uh, couple of headsets. And then my colleagues have got some more and then um, other people within the faculty, if they've got any, just like go grab whatever you can get and uh, get as many together as you can. But um, apart from that, I mean, the headsets work pretty good, you know, anyway. So just if you've got a group of students with you, um, if you're not casting, it, it's much less technically challenging. Um, so anyway, that's my little contribution there. <laughs> and, and Tina, you have an interesting perspective given that you're, you're coming more from a library setting than not necessarily, you know, 
uh, you know, a lab setting or an exact classroom setting, or, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but we'd love to hear kind of more of your thoughts coming from that perspective. Oh, thank you. Yeah, uh, we, uh, library, we have, uh, for the chemistry, we have 30 headsets. I think one of the challenge we are facing is how to deploy, uh, you know, the hardware and the software you know, on that scale. And also, uh, uh, not every university's Wi-Fi uh, wi is equipped to, to, to work with uh, the headsets. Uh, so the VR headsets, that's another challenge. As Anna said, yeah, we use a separate router uh, to, 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 to set up the, the Wi-Fi uh, for this particular class. Also, we use a portable uh, chemistry lab, uh, VR chemistry lab, which means that every time we go, we have uh, an hour to set up and we have an hour to clear up after the class. So, and the class itself is amazing. Students have a very uh, good positive side uh, so uh, it's worth to consider uh, for future time how we can uh, scale up uh, the wi-fi uh, with uh, with all the technology or the management issues and also as it's a very fast developing area uh, all the software and the, uh, the hardware is constantly updating uh, how we do the uh, educational funds uh, what the library found for the emerging technologies such as VR, that's another challenge part we should consider. Definitely. And, and Gareth, you mentioned, uh, you know, while we were prepping that, did you say you have 50 headsets or something like that? So, something, something crazy? Yeah, so, so we've been very, very lucky at the University of Sydney. The Faculty of Engineering um, had the vision to invest in a 26-seat Oculus Rift facility, which is fantastic. And that, that's what uh, catalyzed our, our initial uh, jump into, into VR. And then since then, we bought all of these Quest headsets. But the, 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 I think there's, there's first of all, the, the, the great irony of the, the COVID pandemic has been that the very technology that would have enabled us to, to deploy our classes in a really interactive way in other words, being able to sort of get into a VR environment where you can have this class around you and, and talk in a very natural way. Uh, that wasn't possible because firstly, uh, VR headsets are not consumer level things. We can't assume that, that all students have them, uh, like they all have a, a laptop or a mobile phone. Um, and, and secondly, the, the VR headsets that we had at the university were the first things to be banned when, when the pandemic hit because of the, the health concerns about people exchanging the headsets. So it was all very ironic. And I, and I just wonder, um, although we've been very, very lucky with the facilities that we've had and the support that we've had to buy things, I, I do worry that um, depending on administrators giving that money is is actually going to hold us back and it will I think as soon as the, the VR headsets become something that all students just have like a mobile phone then things will just explode at the moment we're, we're, we're in the same stage that we were in in the mid 1990s with computers like you know you you had to go and get a grant to get a computer to a little computer lab to put on the biochemistry lab it was uh, and 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 if you go into our biochemistry department now you'll see this space where there used to be all these computer consoles it's now and it's now empty and stacked with old books but that's that's sort of where we've got to get to we've got to get to a stage where the vr headsets are a consumer level for us to really take the next step yeah, that's that's uh, definitely a great metaphor in terms of um, you know the '90s and um, you know how that transition from mainframe computing to personal computing happened. Um, Simon, I know that you've over been able to overcome these challenges um, with kind of COVID and whatnot. Would love to hear some of how that process went and and uh, what kind of challenges that you've you've had to overcome. Yeah, so uh, for me, I kind of circumvented the the COVID issue. Issue. I, I'm not sure if the if this was this this was a wise thing to do, uh, but so far no problem has been. Uh, there was no major issue, so uh, I had a rel relatively small class, and I only have like eight devices. Uh, so what I do is I uh, disinfect them and clean them, and then let them uh, dry for about a week, uh, and then I hand I just let let uh, give it to the students so they can keep the device for uh, two to three weeks. 
Uh, so what I re realized is uh, there's kind of actually a learning curve for these softwares. They need to get uh, get used to these controls and how to manipulate molecules and grabbing and expanding and uh, do the rotations and stuff. So there is a definitely definitely a learning curve. So uh, one or two classes won't be enough. So I just give them the device and keep them for a week and then they can play games on it or uh, play on Nano, whatever they want. And then we meet up on virtually uh, so they can do it at their comfort, comfort of their home. I could do it at home. But as uh, Anna mentioned, uh, bandwidth, uh, it, depending on wh where, you're at, where you're living, the, the bandwidth can vary a lot. So we had major issues with, uh, with students just uh, like glitching out of this, uh, in the middle and the whole classroom kind of pausing for, uh, pausing for a sec. That is an issue. So the budget issue, uh, I think it's getting better. Like uh, as uh, Gareth might know, uh, like in the beginning, it, the headsets cost like seven hundred dollars or five hundred dollars, something like that. And then you also need a GPU, a uh, incapable computer. But nowadays, you have a standalone headset, and now the price is down to three hundred dollars. And this semester, for the first time, I've seen students come to me and said, "Oh, I already have my own Oculus Two device. How can I join the class?" I already seen uh, four students with the devices in in my two hundred fifty uh, student class at, at the moment. So I think. Uh, Hopefully, this will uh, uh, this device popularity will, will be more popularized, and then, uh, like, just like uh, buying a textbook, if you have one device, you could use it for chemistry, you can use it for biology, physics. Uh, I hope it becomes a multi-platform device, and uh, and hopefully, uh, all the software companies uh, will be will have in their mind about backward, uh, backwards compatibility. So that uh, in the future, this uh, third generation, fourth generation Oculus com uh, devices come out, the first generation still works in a way, yeah. So, you know, it's interesting, you brought up kind of the, um, that, that's great to hear that students are purchasing their own headsets. You know, what Gareth just mentioned, it seems like it's already coming to fruition in some respects. Um, but, you know, the elephant in the room, I think that I would love to hear about is um, the obvious association with uh, Facebook and the kind of privacy issues, um, you know, given that these, a lot of these, majority of these devices are shared with students. And I'm assuming that there's some kind of, you know, conflict of, of interest in terms of, you know, having students use their Facebook for an academic device and all that kind of stuff. I would love to hear a little bit about, you know, um, how you're thinking about um, what that $300 price point means when it comes to um, how it's being subsidized from uh, Facebook and their data collection, as well as how you're overcoming that. Um, and it, you know, Simon, it just seems like, you know, part of it is that students are logging in with their own Facebook with their own devices. So there's that, but what about the other devices? Oh, so me, so, yeah, uh, so uh, what I, so I, I know that the uh, Facebook ha had a policy that uh, you need to have your own Facebook accounts uh, for each device uh, to have to have it working. And if you don't follow their policy, they ban you from uh, using uh, like <laughs> your, your software purchases all goes away, something like that. But I don't think they have been in uh, like policing that uh, that much. What I'm doing right now, I didn't want every student. A lot of students don't even have Facebook nowadays. So I didn't want everybody to every student to have a Facebook account and uh, use their own account and uh, like do that. So what it is, I just made a, a, a secondary account called uh, LSU Chem VR uh, at, at gmail.com. And then just uh, log in uh, with the same account through all the eight devices. So far I have not been banned. So maybe I was a, a, it was a lucky case. Maybe I, it's because I don't have 50 devices or 30 devices uh, and there's also an option to go with the, the business uh, model of Oculus, Oculus Quest, but those ones cost more than twice. And I, yeah, that was just too much of a stretch for me. So I, yeah. And what about you, Tina, in the uh, library setting? Yeah, so glad you asked that question. So we, uh, so, uh, we have a library uh, inventory management system. So we create an account for, for each asset, for each uh, software. So we use those accounts to purchase, you know, different VR software. So we don't allow students to use their own personal Facebook to log into that. They will mess up our uh, inventory management. So uh, yeah, it's it's challenging. I know it happens uh, in the middle of the uh, pandemic. So we didn't even have a chance to 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 systematic reveal how that affect uh, all the headsets at a large scale. 
Um, Anna, Gareth, I'm curious to hear if you have input in terms of that. I know Gareth hasn't been able to access his headset, so I don't know if this is something that you've had to deal with or not, but um, yeah, Anna, Gareth, feel free to, to add to that. Um, I know, I mean, I've had some technical issues. I don't know that they're specifically Facebook related, um, but un unexplained issues sometimes logging in and where <clears throat> the Quest 2 um, uh, didn't perform as well in that uh, sort of joint environment um, than the other ones. Uh, I don't, you know, the old Quest. Um, so I've got the majority of just the, the first Quest, you know, and then um, just one Quest 2. And um, whilst the resolution is much better, but um, it seems not to be so um, good always with compatibility, but um, I don't know whether that's for Facebook related or not. Um, maybe Gareth has got something else to add. No, no I, I'm actually just laughing because um, I, I didn't actually even realise that this was an issue and I just suddenly realised I've got this big issue to deal with. When, when, when we're able to get back to, uh, to using our Quest headsets, then I, I, I had no idea that, uh, that this, this was looming on the horizon. So yes. I've, I've learned something today and I've also learned I've got an extra job. <laughs> Well, so, you know, what's important to note here is that um, Facebook is not requiring a Facebook login with their Oculus devices for the original Rift as well as the Quest 1 until 2020, I want to say 2023 or something like that. But with the Quest 2s, it, you have to use Facebook from the get-go. So if you don't have Quest 2s, it's not a, you know, you don't have to worry about it for at least in a couple of years. Um, but with the Quest 2s, it's definitely something that, you know, we've seen from our side in terms of educators coming to us um and kind of talking about that so i guess kind of zooming out for a moment in terms of hardware it, it it seems like and especially with given their price point you know the oculus quest does seem like it's like kind of the majority um the head headset that of choice if you will but is that the case are there other headsets that you're keeping an eye on or you're using uh, right now um anybody who wants to talk about other headsets i want to invite them to to start Of course, if that's not the case, and Oculus is the way to go, then that's also yeah. The... Yeah, as you know, for for a while, uh, the the best challenger was uh, HTC Vive, and uh, with the following uh, uh, standalone devices, the HTC uh, uh, the uh, Cosmos devices uh, not doing so well, and there's also been the uh, HP Re Reverb, but cost uh, performance per, per cost uh, so far nothing can challenge the power of Facebook. Um, and Oculus Quest at the moment. So I hope, hopefully, there, they, hopefully there's a, a better challenger that comes along. You know, these, these, things, these things need competition. Yeah, it's a, it's a double-edged sword uh, that the fact that Facebook is, is behind all this is definitely um, something that we've seen um, as, as well. Um, so I guess um, I would love to hear, okay, now that, you know, the headset's set up, we got the budget, like, you know, the software's working. Um, what are some challenges that you face in VR, um, you know, once everything is going? I'd love to hear some of the challenges. Are these things that we can overcome? Is that, is it inherent and fundamental to VR as a medium? i um, love to hear more about that. Gareth, I saw your, your head nodding a lot, so I'll yeah. let you go first. Well, I, I think that the, the thing that everyone needs to appreciate is that just putting a pair of uh, VR goggles on doesn't, doesn't give you a good educational experience. It's still absolutely vital that the person running the class has, has designed uh, some really good activities and 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 you know i said that i've been teaching for 30 odd years but i made the classic mistake in the first first vr session we had i'd i i just went for the sort of hey wow factor and yes for about for about five minutes the students were all enthralled with this new environment but very quickly they tired of that as soon as the novelty had gone away and it became, and, it, and it, I took this amazing picture of them all just sitting there like robots after a while. They were all just sort of like this because they weren't really being asked to do anything. And thankfully, my teaching instincts then kicked in and I realized I had to get them to, to actually interact. And, and, and then suddenly it all took off because as soon as you get them to touch things, as soon as you get them to interact with each other, as soon as you get them to speak to each other, which of course you can do on things when you're using things like Nano, then everything comes alive. And, and so the really big thing that I would say is that yes, 
um, the VR provides an opportunity to teach in new ways, you as an educator have to be flexible and creative and seize those opportunities. Definitely. Yeah. And, and Tina, how, how was your experience like with kind of challenges within the educational setting once everything's set up? Uh, yeah, I, I very much agree with uh, Gareth. Uh, so we are, I consider VR as a tool, as an opportunity to, to open another door. Uh, but in terms of uh, what the content you can uh, use VR to teach or what's the uh, pedagogy method or, or what the kind of a community you want to build on, it's totally uh new <laughs> new to a lot to a lot of educators to create on I, I hope future we have a community to talk about that thing i think that's uh well, that's one of the thing uh well i feel the difficulty with and also the learning curve uh for not only the students uh but also for, uh, for other faculties how you know not, not it's it's not for uh for everyone to fast adapt that thing uh really uh really quickly that's a thing and we, when we consider uh, from the library perspective when we consider using the technology in the classroom and out of the classroom especially in the classroom it's more challenging but um you know you have to uh, uh to, to curve the, uh, to, to deal with the learning curve spontaneously uh for these so many students uh, in one room so uh so that's our yeah, so I would say VR is a very great tool and then, uh, yeah, and we are working on a way to build more content or, or just explore more uh, pedagogy method, uh, how to use that better for the chemistry field. I think not even in the classroom, I think maybe for the research project in future time, just my thought. Anna, do you, do you feel similarly about kind of the content and, and similar challenges that you face as well? Yes, look, I I, um, I agree with all of, of that, and um, you know I, I've just sort of noticed, I guess um, I don't know if it's a general trend, but uh, for us, we, you know, we seem to get more and more students um, with a little bit of a, a deficit in their basic chemistry knowledge. Um, so one of the things that I do is just you know at the beginning is, is give the students some. Um, assume knowledge and uh, stuff to go and have a look at before we even start the course and you know if they're if they're feeling a bit unsure about functional groups and things you know to go go here and learn about this but i think this is where nano really uh, helps a lot because it, it really brings to life um the differences between you know the electronegativity of, of certain atoms and because they're all colored you know negative and positives and all of those interactions that you're trying to to teach about um, really brings it to life when they can actually see it so well. And the you know protein ligand interactions, which is what I talk about a lot, you know, with, with drug design and everything. And you know, it just brings that to life so much because they can actually see, okay, well, if my ligand has got carboxyl group there, we've got a negative charge, that's kind of red. You know, we're gonna look for what what kind of residues in here, you know, are gonna be able to provide um, a counter ion in there. Uh, or something like that, you know, and, and it just, um, I don't know, I, I love it. I, I get really excited about teaching that. And I, I can see from those students that, that it helps them quickly get up to speed, you know, with the functional group identification, recognizing, you know, what is going to stable, uh, stabilize that ligand in the binding site, et cetera. Um, in terms of, I think you mentioned, you know, uh, at the beginning, one of the limitations, I think the, the thing I would love um, to be able to do, um, you know, with the academic version is to be able to um, bring in my own files, you know, because often, you know, certain, even when you're talking about haemoglobin, if you want to download oxyhemoglobin, you know, from PDB, it's not in the form, maybe it's just a dimer or something, and you have to uh, modify it to, to make it into a tetramine. You can do all that, um, but reload it back in um, or modify the protein somehow, and you want to Bring your own proteins back in there. Um, I can't do that yet, um, but that would be that would be great. <laughs> um, but apart from that, yeah, we could definitely um, yeah we could definitely help you out with that uh, as well. So happy to have that uh, conversation offline. Um, awesome. so I, I know that you're you're not necessarily in uh, what's the word uh, drug discovery or um, you know more on the, the organic side. I, I know you do um, some polymer chemistry and things like that would love to hear kind of how you might have a different perspective to this or are the challenges kind of universal regardless of you know what exact kind of section of chemistry you're in 
Yeah, so, so for, first things first, uh, I, my dying uh, like uh, wish on, uh, uh, of nano is, is to have like uh, molecular orbitals, uh, orbitals uh, showing up on the molecule. So I want to uh, see this, I have the students uh, visualize the, where the P orbitals are and where the lone pairs are sticking out. So uh, for, this, uh, for, for my physical organic chemistry course or my organic courses, so that would be great. Um, yeah, uh, and other than that, I think it's a cutting edge technology that is just being implemented into education. Uh, I hope I know all the answers of the best method to teach students, but on, I also do not know, I'm still learning and the students are learning as well. So I think uh, when I go to these, uh, online VR sessions with the students, I consider them being in the same entry level as I am. So what I do is I uh, do a couple of uh, uh, teaching demos. Uh, the f one of the uh, fun things that uh, students uh, start entertaining was I give them a quiz, like a quiz show, uh, like, like some kind of elimination game. I, I give uh, some kind of a molecule and one isomer, one of them uh, can save you, one of them can kill you. And then uh, you have to, they have to pick sides. The good thing about VR is you could uh, teleport wherever you want. You don't have to physically move around. So they pick sides and one side, uh, half of the students go to one side, half of the students go to the other side. And they have, it makes up an active discussion amongst them, among themselves. And then they kind of think of how, where the chiral center is and decide that. So that's a, a fun activity that I found. And the other thing that I do is I uh, let the students uh, come up with their own teaching modules and then let them present and let them guide uh, uh, like uh, guide the class. So, and also do uh, show and tell. So I let students do their show and tell, uh, show and tell their favorite molecule. And the students' interests are very, like, it's very, uh, has a very broad spectrum. Some students like uh, uh, explosive molecules, some students like drugs, some students like poisons. So some students just uh, bring morphine. Oh, I had this last time and it, it feels good. And uh, so that's a fun thing. And then uh, students who are, are more interested in these kind of things, they bring up the drug molecule and then they compare it. I've seen one student compare that drug molecule of a neurotransmitter that occur, occurs in our body. And then actually went to uh, the PDB structure database and then uh, downloaded the molecule where, is that, where that neurotransmitter is like bound onto the protein. So there are, I definitely learned a lot from that students uh, through those uh, uh, student run course uh, sections. So. It sounds I'm, fantastic. Yeah, I, I, I love the way that you uh, uh, are basing everything that you're doing on uh, it, realizing that it's what the students do that's important and not what we do. Um, but also I love the way that you leverage the, the ability of Nanome to physically orient and displace the students. So they're actually having to make that choice about which side of the room they went on. I, I think that's that's one of the, the marvelous things about the the VR environment that you you can do that. So, yeah, absolutely fantastic. So I want to shift gears into some um, audience questions now, and actually this is directly related to kind of what uh, Simon said just now. Uh, we have a, um, a audience question from uh, Caroline that asks: uh, Were grades associated with VR activities? If so, what type of graded activities? Uh, did this replace? Uh, what percentage of the grades is allocated for VR activities? So, uh, you know, Simon, in your case, were you grading, were they teleported or were, how, how's that kind of interaction and how did that tie in with the student performance? Uh, uh, well, I haven't, haven't, I have not graded, uh, I, I given grades uh, according to the VR courses. I gave it some kind of an extra, extra points uh, for my small class where every students were able to uh, take the VR devices home uh, because that class was uh, less than 20 students. So the students had like two or three weeks to have the device to themselves and get used to it. And then I graded their, uh, uh, their, their teaching modules, but I essentially uh, gave them extra credit and uh, gave them full, full points because nobody has an answer. So I can't judge whether they're teaching good or not. Uh, so that's, that's the thing, it's the wild west here. Uh, for the larger classes, definitely I cannot do that because uh, with 200, uh, 250 students and eight, only eight devices, only students who, uh, who sign up early, uh, first come first serve can uh, do those events. So uh, I no grades associated yet, we're still learning. Um, and what, what, I can't remember the other question, but yeah. Well, I think it's just, um, you know, the topic of grades and, and yeah. you know, how VR can be incorporated with 
student performance in general, I think is, is, is a topic. You know, Gareth, if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, yeah. no, I was going to say, I mean, uh, I mean, we do grade the students. We, we, there's about 10% of the grade for the, the course on it. Uh, I'm more than happy if any of the, um, the, the, the attendees would, would like, um, you know, the, the, the assessment tasks that we've designed and the, and the sort of marking rubrics that, that go with that, more than happy to, to share that. But basically, um, yeah, we, we do expect the students to um, create and present a guided tour of a molecule in, in virtual reality. And, and a lot of the marks for that are are based on their planning and they can show their planning by, by devising um, a sketch in, in things like PyMol and Sketchfab and so on. So there's a lot of preparation work. You can scaffold the assessment so that they're getting a lot of the marks before they even get into the, uh, into the VR environment. But I would say that the assessments that we've run have been tremendously successful because when we have the students and the professors in the VR environment, it's a great leveler. Like everybody's just this avatar. And whereas in a traditional, say, PowerPoint presentation, the students are giving a very stilted presentation. It's all very, you know, it's all very formal and they're very tight and everything. When, when they're in VR, it's a very, it's a very different dynamic. It, there's a great equality. There are people talking, professors, that the students start asking the professors questions in, you know, they say, I think this histidine is doing this. What do you think, Professor Bloggs? And it, it, it's very, very different to the normal classroom tutorial or presentation environment. So I think assessment works really well in VR. Yeah, I want to add, um, uh, we did a great uh, as all or none. Uh, so we asked the student to take a selfie of their molecule because of their assignment, uh, uh, you know, involved in building the molecule. So, and then we do the share, a group, uh, a parent share. So two students work on the uh, same molecule and take a selfie and share with the group member. So, so all or none. And also that course content associated with our midterm. And then we do the assessment, uh, ask the student how you feel the VR will help you to get a better grade uh, on the exam or not. So yeah, the, uh, the assessment is pretty uh, successful. People have a, a high uh, positive uh, review of the VR for their exam performance. And uh, do you have any thoughts on kind of the assessment and grading portion? Um, we, we don't have any uh, assessments associated <clears throat> specifically with the VR at the moment, um, but I have a, a group assignment um, that students do um, regarding, and they each get allocated a amino acid sequence. They, go, they have to go and hunt for um, what protein it is. It's, it's something of therapeutic use, and um, I'm trying to get them to um, come along to do the VR activity um, with their protein, and then they can actually look at their own protein, so it helps them um, about you know the assessment item, but it's not specifically on VR assessment, if you know what I mean. But um, and I think for us, it's for probably just limited by the fact that we 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 don't have that many, um, we don't have enough uh, for everybody. Um, but it's certainly helpful for them. I think you know what, when they're doing their other assessment. Um, yep. mm. So I think what both Anna and Semin are, are doing in sort of giving students ownership of a, of a protein and, and asking them about their favorite protein and their favorite molecule and, and building that connection between the student and the molecular structure, it's, it's a very, very healthy uh, thing to do. Definitely. Um, I have a different question from an audience member now, um, shifting gears a little bit, which is uh, which panelists applied for uh, or acquired their headsets um, and, and software license via institutional education grants. If there's time, I'd like to hear more about how receptive, amicable these programs are and were to their teaching objectives. Um, this has been touched on a little bit uh, already, but I think I'm curious to hear more. So um, anybody wants to comment on, on kind of getting educational grants um, and how receptive the results were or anything like that? I really think that would be very idiosyncratic between different institutions. I mean, some institutions are known for being quite conservative and some are known for being innovative. And then you have individuals that are making these decisions. So it, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult to, to, to give a general answer to it. <laughs> yeah. Like 
Definitely. Uh, Tina, I know that, you know, um, uh, you and uh, Harvard published a paper that uh, late last year in the uh, Journal of Chemistry Education. Uh, what was that process like? And maybe if you can share a little bit about that experience, that would be uh, awesome. Uh, the grants? Uh, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, so uh, that uh, that project supported by the, the library innovation grants. Uh, so when we talk about grants, it probably uh, that uh, we are technology probably across different disciplines uh, in the higher education, like a teaching will be a thing, uh, IT or even the library. So uh, my, my 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 sense is uh yeah uh, do not you know limit yourself to uh to what what kind of uh, educational brands uh you will uh think uh just brought it, uh, the way uh so uh for our project uh we got uh we i apply for the grants and then create uh the vr headsets and then uh, that uh, vr headsets uh, as uh, a portable uh, vr lab so that lab could be applicable to uh a, a broader uh undergraduate chemistry courses that's our goal uh so and that that is a green and uh, not expensive so the total cost is under two, uh 20k no from the software and hardware and uh, the first two year of the student's cost uh, but for the long term there are probably some uh maintenance such as higher students for the software and um, uh, hardware maintenance uh cost uh that's probably one of the uh from the grants um, so I think I want to wrap up with the last question, uh, which is looking forward, um, you know, as we head into 2021 um, and into the 2020s in general, um, we'd love to hear from each panelist on what you look forward to the most in relation to VR and, and chemistry education. And, and this is very free form and open ended. So I'm, I'm looking forward to some of the answers. So Anna, do you want to start us off? Sure, absolutely. Thanks for that. Um, well, I mean, I, I'm more of the same, basically, I, and and really, the technology where it's going is very exciting for me. And you know, I think um, it was Gareth that was talking about that uh, leveler um, between you know the academic and the students, and um, all of that's kind of like taken away when you're all in there together, and it's just transforms the experience not only for the student but also for, for me too. And, um, you know, and I, I guess, you know, we want more of that. We want more of that and to be able to offer it to as many students as we can. I think um, the learning is just, you know, a, a byproduct of, of the enjoyment that you get out of it. So yes, more please. <laughs> Gareth? Uh, well, the two, the two things I'm looking forward to the most is uh, VR headsets being consumer level, so we can assume that all students have them. Um, uh, the more software, because one of, the, one of the limitations we haven't spoken about in this meeting today is the fact that having purchased all the hardware, uh, it's very frustrating if you're limited by the software that's available. So hopefully the production of more, you know, consumer level headsets will mean more software developers will, will get on board. But the, the big thing I'm really looking forward to are hands. The ability to actually feel when you touch a molecule and to hold it in your hand and to actually, to, 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 to actually sort of have that sensation. And I think that Oh, we've, we've actually said a lot um, at little snippets during this meeting uh, that one of the really big things that makes you feel like you're engaging, and Keita, you said this right at the start, was this feeling that you're immersed because you almost feel you can touch the molecules. Well, if you can actually touch them and you can pass them from one person to another and you can pick up a, a ligand and put it into a, a binding site, well i mean it's uh, then things really take off so that's i'm really looking forward to hands <laughs> tina oh and, and we're having some issues with the your audio yeah nope sorry but okay. tina if you want to yeah take this time real quick uh, yeah go ahead 
Okay, yeah, yeah. What I hope is uh, I wanted that uh, the, the VR are more broadly used uh, in, in more educational field. I feel that's a fantastic technology and uh, uh, broadly field. And also people have no uh, barrier of uh, access to hardware or the software. Uh, I hope it could be run on the PC or the, 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 the like of web page, uh, you know, or, or, or software that could be run on the PC or, or, or backs on the computer directly uh, or on the headsets, uh, both of them. And also uh, for the uh, online teaching, we have learned that I hope the VR <laughs> could have uh, some, uh, uh, build some bridge, uh, you know, uh, for the online teaching. Awesome, Simon. Yeah, for me, I, I first uh, wish uh, the COVID-19 is, is done with, uh, with all the vaccinations coming out. And finally, we can uh, uh, share headsets and a, a more in a more comfortable way. Uh, and don't uh, get too worried. At, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, software is being more uh, popular, that will be good. And especially for education, I think uh, it's, uh, we're kind of, uh, kind of the, one of the first people to uh, try to use uh, VR as ed education. I think we need to try to advertise more so that more people are getting experiences. The problem, I think the problem is uh, VR, when you uh, look in the, uh, like a, a web page or, or, or some kind of article, it, it looks fancy, but you don't know it until you experience it. So it's something that you have to experience to really uh, uh, get into. So uh, I think uh, we all must uh, try to uh, advertise this platform as much as people as possible, expand this platform so that more people can jump, to it, jump into it, more people jump into the development of this better softwares and better headsets um, and yeah, make education better overall over the years, yes. Fantastic. Um, well, we are terribly sorry. We have a ton of other questions that I'm seeing on both the chat and the Q&A boxes. Unfortunately, we're not going to get them today. But the good news is um, we can, we're going to continue the discussion on our user Slack group, uh, which you can uh, go to nanum.ai slash Slack, and uh, we can uh, continue the discussion there. Um, I know that uh, you know, for today, we only had an hour to have a live discussion, but uh, definitely uh, encourage you all to um, join the user Slack group and we can continue the, the conversation there. So thank you again to all the amazing panelists. Um, it was fascinating to hear all of the stuff that you are doing with uh, virtual reality and chemistry education. Um, and uh, we wish you the best of luck. And as Simon said, hopefully uh, we can actually hope meet in person sometime. So really looking forward to that. And uh, thanks again. Thanks, everyone.